Hello everyone and welcome to the 1-800-RESPECT webinar series. Today's topic is vicarious trauma, looking after yourself at work. 1-800-RESPECT is pleased to welcome Anne Law Quinu. Anne Law is a traumatic specialist with the Australian Centre of Post-Traumatic Mental Health. She is a psychologist psychologist with extensive experience in the treatment of post-traumatic traumatic mental health problems in hospital and community settings. Her main area of interest is interpersonal <coughs> violence, particularly sexual, ab sexual abuse and assault as well as war-related trauma. Anne Law is an experienced trainer and supervisor who has led several projects including large-scale training and dissemination programs for services such as Centres Against Sexual Assault and the Veterans and Veterans Families Counselling Service. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posing questions to the presenter. Please note that case specific information cannot be answered during this webinar. All other questions can be typed into the chat box which is located at the bottom left hand side of your screen. Responses to your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We also encourage you to participate in the online discussion tool which you will be redirected to after completing the survey. We will be closing this thread at 2.15pm, so jump on if you have any further questions that we may not have time for during the next 45 minutes. I'd now like to pass you over to Anne Law to begin. Hello everyone. Um, I will take you through uh, the presentation on looking after yourself at work and vicarious trauma. Uh, this is a very densely and packed presentation, so I might go through slides very quickly, but hopefully we'll have a lot of time at the end of the um, presentation for you to ask questions. Uh, in this presentation, um, what I will take you through is uh, what vicarious trauma is about and describe the impact of working with people who experience interpersonal violence. I'll also talk about uh, what puts workers at risk of vicarious trauma and what can help protect them. I will particularly focus on strategies that organizations and individual workers can use to protect practitioners from the impact of working with trauma. Um, I'll also use um, some case examples and I'll talk about when to get help and the kind of help that is most likely to make a difference uh, when you do seek it. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is to walk you through a case of someone that has experienced vicarious trauma. Uh, this is a case based on the experience of a child protection workers, and I'll just read you the case out loud and then talk through the themes of traumatic tra um, vicarious trauma. Um, I have worked in child protection for two years. I came to the job right after finishing my degree. I thought I was doing okay, but then I started feeling overwhelmed, like nothing I did could possibly make a difference. Now I'm often staying late at work, trying to get on top of things, but the files just keep piling up. I don't sleep well, and when I do, I have bad dreams, especially about one of the cases I handled six months ago, a toddler being abused that I couldn't help. I keep seeing her getting abused, and I can't stop it from happening. I mentioned struggling with a couple of cases to my manager. She suggested I ring the employee assistance program. In my team, we talk about the cases and the stress of having pending files, but we don't really talk about ourselves. My partner has no idea about what's going on. So that's a fairly typical response uh, to um, uh, having to work with traumatic materials. Um, one of the things that I'd like to highlight in this case is that it involves being triggered by having heard about someone talking about their traumatic experience, in this case a child. Um, the other thing that happens with vicarious trauma is often the person feels unable to help or ineffective with a client. Uh, and that's often a trigger for vicarious trauma. Um, another thing that's quite common with vicarious trauma is having difficulties like not being able to sleep, uh, having dreams or intrusive images about uh, what you heard your client talk about, um, having uh, feelings like you're inadequate and able to help. So that's very common. Um, 
The other thing that's very common with vicarious trauma is uh, changes in patterns of work. So often people that experience vicarious trauma will either over-engage with work to try to make a difference, so they'll work longer hours, uh, spend more time on certain cases, uh, or they'll disengage completely. So they'll do things like take time off work, uh, feel like they have to stop caring in order to cope, uh, uh, have a lot of sick days, things like that. Uh, so that's very common as well. Um, two things that I'd like to highlight in this case that are very common in cases of vicarious trauma is that it often involves uh, new workers or young workers, people that don't have much experience in a job. So we know that people that have just started are much more vulnerable to vicarious trauma than experienced workers. Uh, and the other thing that I'd like to highlight in this case is the isolation the worker is feeling. And that's very common as well, that one of the biggest risk factors with vicarious trauma is um, not being able to talk to your colleagues your friends or your family about what's happening for you. So that's fairly typical as well. Uh, if you read about vicarious trauma, uh, you're likely to get very confused. If you look at the literature, um, there's a lot of terms that are used when talking about vicarious trauma. And you may have heard terms like burnout, uh, secondary traumatization, uh, vicarious trauma, and it can become very confusing about what we're talking about when we talk about vicarious trauma. I want to particularly focus on burnout and vicarious trauma. Uh, the two terms that you'll uh, hear being used when talking about the impact of working with people that have experienced violence uh, or have been traumatized. Uh, burnout is linked to cumulative work stress. So that's when you have uh, experience over a long period of time, a lot of stress, either related to your clients or to your organization. And it often leads to long-term dissatisfaction with work, with a sense of uh, hopelessness, feeling ineffective at work, uh, feeling quite cynical about work in many cases. Um, and it can lead to serious emotional problems like anxiety and depression and long-term health problems. Um, Vicarious trauma is really about uh, being exposed to traumatic materials when you work with uh, clients. So that's really hearing clients talking about traumatic events that have happened to them and having to manage the consequences of those uh, traumatic events. Um, and vicarious trauma can lead, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to symptoms that can look very similar to the, uh, the symptoms that are experienced by people that uh, directly experience violence and trauma. So symptoms that look like post-traumatic stress disorder or depression. So that includes feeling wound up, feeling hopeless, uh, having nightmares or intrusive thoughts about uh, what the client talked about. Um, and these uh, symptoms can be short-lasting, so you can experience it for a week or two weeks and then they go away, but sometimes it can be become longer lasting and start to impact on your life. Um, the other thing with vicarious trauma is that it can affect a worker's view of themselves or the world, uh, particularly their sense of feeling safe in the world, feeling safe with clients, with their boss, with their colleagues and their family. Uh, it can affect their sense of feeling in control and uh, their trust in other people. Um, Having given you a very brief overview of vicarious trauma and burnout, um, I just wanted to uh, take you to a polling question uh, about burnout or vicarious trauma. Uh, what I'd like you to think about is that uh, in the past year, uh, whether you or a colleague have experienced vicarious trauma or burnout. So I'll wait for the results to show as you select uh, the yes or no response. <coughs> As you can see from the polling response that's uh, uh, showing up on your screen, um, having experienced uh, either some vicarious trauma, so um, really having been distressed by being exposed to uh, traumatic materials uh, presented by your clients, um, 
can be quite common, uh, but also burnout, which is a less common response, is something you see particularly in the industries like uh, child protection, uh, trauma-specific counseling services, uh, uh, workplaces where there's a lot of uh, traumatized clients where you can start seeing quite a bit of vicarious trauma and burnout. Um, when, when you look at the literature, uh, what you find is that um, uh, in industries where you see a lot of uh, trauma and traumatized clients, uh, you see about around 50% to 60% of people that have some experiences of vicarious trauma. So it's very similar to what you're seeing on your poll right now. Uh, so it's uh, uh, those uh, symptoms where you find yourself thinking about your clients, having maybe nightmares or intrusive thoughts about their trauma and feeling wound up or hopeless. Um, that's very different from other workplaces where people feel uh, less trauma, where usually it's about the 5 to 10 percent mark. In terms of burnout, that's much lower. So in terms of burnout, even in industries where you see a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, difficult clients, a lot of complex trauma, even there the, the level of burnout is fairly low. So it's between 5 and 6 percent depending on the studies you're looking at. So it's not as common, but it is very serious when it's experienced. Um, one of the things with uh, vicarious trauma and burnout is that they tend to overlap. So uh, uh, when we talk about vicarious trauma, for some people it becomes um, really uh, an experience of burnout where they're finding it very difficult to find meaning and enjoyment in their work and it's starting to become uh, depressed. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, what puts people at risk of experiencing vicarious trauma. Uh, there are three things really that put people most at risk and I refer to those to a certain extent when I presented uh, the, um, uh, the case study early on in a presentation. Uh, one of the biggest um, risk factors when it comes to vicarious trauma is feeling isolated and having no support, either in your work but also in your home life. Um, so uh, in terms of support, uh, this is having no access to colleagues or managers that either acknowledge or understand the impact of working with uh, survivors of violence or with people that have experienced trauma. And at home it means not being able to talk about the impact the work is having on you. The other biggest risk factor, as I said earlier on, is being new to the job. So workers that have just started, that are just out of uni, for example, or just out of their training, and it's the first time after the job, are much more likely uh, to experience vicarious trauma. They, they don't yet have the skills or the experience that will help buffer them from the impact of hearing traumatic material. Um, the third biggest factor is really not finding enough meaning in your work, particularly not feeling effective in your work. So it's uh, feeling like you can't help your clients. And that seems to be a very big risk factor. Um, so from an organizational point of view, um, if you have an organization that doesn't offer uh, team-based support around uh, working with violence or where managers are not recognizing the impact of working with survivors of violence, that's a risk factor. Uh, the other thing is n making sh not having processes in place to make sure that workers feel safe when they're working with clients. Uh, we know that some clients that have experienced violence and have experienced trauma can become uh, threatening themselves uh, because they have uh, issues with anger and irritability and power. And those experiences of being threatened by a client also are a risk factor uh, for uh, workers. And also having inadequate training. So not having the training to deal with people that have experienced trauma can put 
pe put people at risk because then they feel like they can't help their clients. Uh, and uh, unbalanced workload also make uh, our risk factor because if you ha we know that if you have a high level of stress at, at work, you're more vulnerable to vicarious trauma. Uh, from a worker's experience, on top of being new to the job and having diminished job dissatis uh, satisfaction, uh, the other risk factor is having a previous trauma history. But that really depends on your level of experience in a job and uh, your ability to have an impact on your clients. So we know that a very experienced worker that have uh, good skills feel like they're making a difference in their job uh, and don't seem to be at risk even when they have a previous history of trauma. Uh, the work with clients in terms of risk factors, it's really the biggest risk factor is feeling unsafe with your clients. Uh, that's a number one risk factor. Uh, being ex the load of uh, exposure to traumatic events, so the, the number of clients you deal with that have experienced violence, um, actually is not necessarily a, a risk factor. It really depends again on uh, your experience and your, ability, and your ability to make an impact for those clients. Um, Part of that also is being able to manage a risk that's often inherent in dealing with survivors of violence, making sure that they're safe, uh, that they're not going to get harmed or harm other people is part of the work and that can add to the stress of working with violence. Uh, so from, a, um, from an in intervention point of view and, and making sure that workers are protected from the impact of working with survivors of violence, there are really three things that need to be attended to. Uh, social support, making sure that uh, workers have access to uh, groups of colleagues that actually talk about the impact of working with violence. Having supervision where there's time where uh, workers can talk about themselves and the impact of the work, not just about the work itself. Uh, there need to be processes in place where workers feel safe with their client and when clients are threatening, there are things in place to help them deal with those threats. And they need to have um, enough time and space and enough training that they feel they can be effective with their clients and be satisfied with their work. So in terms of uh, um, man managing a workplace uh, that uh, is going to lead to workers being resilient in the face of working with trauma. It's really important to have clear policies and procedures uh, regarding helping people who have experienced violence. It's very clear what the interventions are and the expectations. That you have regular ongoing skill development in evidence-based practice. So that might mean that if, for example, for case workers that we deal with homelessness, with child protection, that they have training around trauma-informed care, uh, for counselors that they know about trauma-focused treatment, or for someone uh, uh, like a child care worker that they're really well trained in how they're going to report uh, incidences of child abuse, for example. Uh, and as I said, having uh, opportunities as a team and individually to talk about how the work is impacting on you is incredibly important. Um, also, uh, there need to be avenue for people who do or go on to develop uh, problems and distress when they experience trauma um, that uh, they have uh, clear processes in place to access support. So not just who they can uh, call for help, but so they know what kind of support they're going to get as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, work balance and dealing with current threat is, uh, procedures are very important as well. In terms of uh, individual workers, what can an individual worker do to um, protect themselves from the daily impact of working with survivors of violence? Uh, as I mentioned, the most important thing a worker can do is seek meaningful support, and not just at work, but also at home. Uh, 
the other thing is to be aware of the impact of the work. So it's uh, having ways of monitoring yourself um, on a regular basis because uh, a vicarious trauma and burnout can have an insidious impact. So it can really creep up on you. And it's really important to have ways of assessing where you are at in your work. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And the other thing is to have skills um, to help manage the distress when it does come up, when you're dealing with a really difficult client or with uh, the story of a terrible thing that happened to one of your clients. Uh, and I'll again talk about that in a minute um, and give you some examples of the skills that you can use and learn for that. Uh, and finally, again, and I'm, uh, I'm repeating myself, but really important is making sure you have the right training and supervision and advocating for that very strongly. Uh, in terms of connections at work and at home, I've talked at length now about what kind of support you need from a manager and from your peers and colleagues at work. Uh, but the other thing that's really important is making sure that uh, at home you have uh, either family, friends, uh, that uh, you have a meaningful contact with, that you can talk to about the impact the work has on you, but also give you a sense of belonging and meaning outside of work. So that can buffer you from the impact of your work, and that's really important. So if you find yourself that you're, uh, you place uh, all your energy into work and less in your relationship at home, you're much more likely to be affected by uh, working with trauma and uh, survivors of violence. Um, I have another qu polling question to ask, and that's uh, whether you believe that you have the support you need to buffer you from the impact of working with trauma, so uh, both at work and at home. And the reason I'm asking that question is that it's really the number one protective factor and such an important factor. So from what I can see at the moment, about 78% of people um, have in place enough support to deal with the work that they do. Um, if you ask uh, the ones that are in the 25% um, uh, range, uh, the 25, um, one of the 25% people that don't have the support that they need, uh, I would suggest that uh, either um, you seek some form of support. So for example, if your workplace environment is not supportive, consider external supervision. Uh, or make sure that you have increased support at home or find a friend that can support you. Uh, and if you find yourself over-engaging at work and not putting enough energy in your relationships at home to, to make a plan to change that because it will be the biggest, uh, will have the biggest impact in your ability to uh, manage vicarious trauma and, and uh, also prevent uh, being traumatized by your current materials. Um, I'll very briefly, and we have about five minutes left, but I'll very briefly talk to you a few skills that are very useful to learn about and rehearse in order to manage the day-to-day -day impact of working with survivors of violence. Now, for those of you who do some counseling or casework, these skills are going to sound very familiar. It's probably what you teach your client, but it's often something as workers that we don't use ourselves. Uh, and if you're not familiar with those skills, I would encourage you to seek some training uh, or to uh, ask your manager to organize some training around those skills because they can protect you and help you manage the distress of working with violence. One is uh, skills around tolerating negative emotions. Um, and there's two skills really that are really important to learn. One is to learn to uh, sit with emotion, learn to ride the wave of emotion when you be becoming distressed. Not avoiding those negative distressing emotions and also not dwelling on them, but uh, sitting with those emotions and observing them. And often that's referred to as mindfulness techniques. And they're very useful techniques to have. The other uh, techniques that are very important are techniques to help you decrease the intensity of feelings. And they're often called distraction or grounding techniques, and you also can use breathing techniques uh, that are very simple and that can be very helpful in decreasing the intensity of distress. Um, the other thing that's very important is to make sure that you keep accessing 
positive emotions in your day-to-day -day life and engage in activities that give your life meaning. So we know that people that experience a lot more positive emotions do pleasurable activity um, uh, and engage in, acti uh, engage in uh, activities, relationships that give their life meaning do much better when they're faced with a very difficult or adverse situation. Um, and the other very important thing is, is to make sure you don't use drugs and alcohol or medication to cope or numb yourself when you're feeling distressed. And it's something often we tell our clients, but we don't do ourselves. And I think often there can be a, an underlying problem of drug and alcohol use in our profession that is not talked about and it's very important to, to seek help or to make sure you don't use that uh, and get trapped in using alcohol or drugs to cope. Um, the other thing that I'd like to talk about uh, is the common um, uh, thinking errors that, or thinking traps that people fall into, uh, particularly when they're dealing with people um, um, that have experienced trauma and they, when they have heavy workload and they feel like they have to help their client. And this kind of, think, this kind of thinking often uh, makes someone much more vulnerable than to uh, feeling affected by their client's trauma history. Um, one of those types of uh, thinking is often called black and white thinking. That's uh, that all or nothing thinking where someone uh, uh, feels like they, for example, have to uh, help their client 100% and if they haven't helped their client 100%, uh, then they haven't helped them at, at all. Or uh, they can tell themselves things like, I'm completely responsible for my client care. Or the opposite of that, that's not my problem at all. Uh, this kind of rigid thinking often lead to a sense of feeling overwhelmed um, and can lead to people increasing their investment in work to a, to a degree where they no longer have a work-life balance and not looking, looking after themselves and take um, their client's story to heart to, to such an extent that they get really affected by their work. Um, the other common uh, thinking trap that workers fall into when they work with a lot of traumatic material is uh, making judgment based on the outcomes for the client, bad outcomes. So if you have a client that's uh, taking risks, uh, that uh, has attempted suicide, for example, that they make a judgment based on the fact that they've had a bad outcome. So oh, I must not have done enough because now they've attempted suicide or that child is now unsafe, it must have been because I didn't do the right thing. Uh, when in, so it's making a judgment based on the outcome. And the other common thinking traps is uh, where people uh, think about the worst possible outcome to a situation, so, uh, which is uh, very easy to do when you're dealing with very serious things like people uh, being at risk because of their symptoms or being at risk because they experience experiencing violence on, uh, on an ongoing basis. And that feeling like, if I don't do something now, something terrible will happen to my client. So it can lead to a lot of anxiety, uh, which often one way that pe when people are catastrophizing and feel extremely anxious, one way they cope is again, to try to avoid feeling anxious by uh, not thinking about it or by using alcohol and drugs, for example, to think, think, stop thinking about it. Uh, so it can have very negative impact. Um, one way to manage um, uh, the impact of working with uh, violence is to be really aware of those thinking traps, uh, catching yourself when you do have them. Um, and, uh, and once you do, asking you, uh, challenging them. And you can do that by asking yourself if these thoughts are based on fact. Uh, examining how much you control you really have on the outcomes for your client, uh, noticing if you use black and white terms like, you know, um, my client never comes on time, uh, nobody ever cares about me, no one does a job they need to do at work, those kind of statements. Uh, and coming up with uh, an alternative way of looking at things and rehearsing it. Uh, again, if you're not uh, if you haven't got any training in this, I would encourage you to do that because, again, research shows that being flexible in your thinking um, 
really makes a difference and really protects you from the impact of vicarious trauma. Um, I'm just running out of time, so I'll be very quick, but there are uh, signs of uh, when you need to seek help. Uh, so you, if you notice any changes in emotions, your thinking, particularly if you have uh, recurring thoughts and dreams about your client and you're preoccupied with your client, if you have changes in your pattern of attendance at work, you're avoiding work, you're spending too much time at work, and you're with, starting to change at home as well, withdrawing from family, it may be time for you to seek help. Um, and um, one of the and uh, one of the ways to monitor if you have had any changes in your behavior is asking friends and family about whether you have changed in any way. Uh, keeping a daily diary uh, for a week or two about how much uh, you what you do at work, how much time you you spending at work, how much time you're dedicating to rest, entertainment, social life. But you also have some scales you can use to look at uh, how you're feeling at the moment and how you're traveling at the moment, like the professional quality of life scales, which is freely available online. Um, just to keep monitoring yourself because, again, as I said, uh, these feelings can sneak up on you and sometimes by the time you catch yourself and realize something is wrong, it, it, you, it may have affected you for a long time. So if you can catch them early, that's good. Um, uh, getting help um, uh, really depends on how much you're affected by uh, the story of the um, trauma survivor and your your being uh, having heard the story of a trauma survivor or dealing with the aftermath of that trauma with them. Uh, if you are upset and distressed by recent contact and you have some of the vicarious, the, the symptoms of vicarious trauma for a week, uh, you have some nightmares maybe or some, you find yourself keep thinking about that, that person you're working with and their trauma, it's a good idea to talk to a colleague or manager you trust about it uh, and talk to them about strategies you could use to help yourself. Um, and they, everyone is different. For some people, what they need most is practical help. So help with paperwork, having a bit of time off to have time to, to really look after themselves. But other people will need emotional support, so really need acknowledgement of what they're going through by a colleague or their manager or family and friends. So to know what you need at that point, and everyone is different. Um, uh, and the other thing is if you're not coping, so if you notice long-term changes in, um, in your work patterns, in your emotions, in your health, that it's really good to, it's really important to seek help early uh, before p problems become entrenched. Uh, you're more likely to recover quickly if you seek help early. So you can either contact your employee assistance program if you've got one. You can also ring 1-800-RESPECT uh, to get help. Uh, and uh, you need to make sure that the help you get is effective. So it's not just about getting supportive counseling. You need to be taught practical strategies like to help you re-engage in activities and relationships that give meaning, uh, to tolerate and manage negative emotions, and to change your thinking if you're um, engaging in your thinking traps I described and solve problems effectively at work. Uh, so practical strategy are m much more likely to lead to quick recovery than just supportive counseling. And I've got just some resources and reference that you can look at if you're interested in learning more about uh, vicarious trauma um, or burnout. Um, and I'll hand over now uh, to, for some questions to the, the webinar team. Thanks, Anne Law, for, Law, for that enlightening presentation. I think we all now have a very good understanding of what vicarious trauma is and how to look after ourselves at work and when to get help. Um, now, we are going to open up for some questions for Anne Law to answer. So if you would like to ask a question, please do so by typing the questions into the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. Now we have had a few questions come through here. Um, so our first question and law comes from Alison. I work extensively with young people who are suicidal. It is easy to feel that something terrible will happen if you can't guarantee the client's safety. How can you manage the feeling of uh, balancing their responsibility with the workers? Yes, that's a very good question. 
I think for that, the first thing is getting very good supervision because if you do that extensively, it's easy to lose perspective on uh, 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 one, how much you can can cope with and how safe they are, uh, and two, um, on how much responsibility you have for that client. So having someone on a regular basis uh, examining cases with you and examining uh, these issues, so how, how safe is a client, uh, is the work you're doing uh, effective with them to make sure that they stay safe, uh, and how much you feel responsible for that client is really important. And I would suggest if you have working very intensively with uh, suicidal clients that um, that you do that at least on a fortnightly basis. So if uh, some people can do that sometimes with a manager, sometimes with an external supervisor, if you've got access to that, it's very important to have some form of reflective practice with someone else. You can do that through peer uh, discussions as well. Um, the other thing is to really uh, make sure that you think through uh, what uh, what you've done for the client, what the plan was for the client, and focus on that rather than the outcomes for the client. And it's very easy for me to say that, um, you know, sitting in this room, but uh, that sometimes is thinking about what is my job, what have I done, have I done my job, rather than thinking about what is a client going to do can be helpful as well. Great. Thanks, Anna Law. Now, we have had lots of questions come through about whether these slides will be available. So I will just let everybody know they are available on the 1800 Respect uh, website. And that link is now in the chat box for everybody there. Our next question comes from Wendy. If a, work, if a worker has previously experienced vicarious trauma, are they more at risk when confronted by similar triggers again? Um, it depends, uh, and it depends on several things. One is how, whether you, the person feels like the previous episode of vicarious trauma was resolved, uh, so they feel that they've come to terms with the pre previous episode of vicarious trauma, it's one thing. Um, the other thing that is the intensity of the symptoms they've experienced as a result of feeling traumatized by what they experienced with their client. So, um, if, for example, the vicarious trauma uh, and, uh, led to um, several months of symptoms and not being able to engage with work, for example, and left to feelings of burnout, uh, that, that makes uh, the person more vulnerable than someone that has had two or three weeks of feeling like they had intrusive thoughts and feelings about and images and maybe nightmares about what happened for their client but I've been able to keep working, uh, uh, haven't isolated themselves from their family. So they've been affected, they're distressed, but they, they're kind of okay and managing. So that makes a difference as well. The other thing, really, the big difference, again, is social support. So if you've had a previous experience of vicarious trauma, it's really important that you have supports in place at work uh, to, to make sure that you have a place where you can talk about the impact of the work on you and how you're going to manage that. And that's true uh, having a one-to-one -one supervision process that's supportive and allows you to do that, either with your manager or externally. And if you can't get it at work, it's really worth either advocating that you work pays for external supervision or that you, you invest in that to, to look after yourself. And the other thing is making sure there's a colleague, a peer supervision process in place so that, you know, when you have team meetings about cases, for example, you have some space uh, that's dedicated to talking about how the work is impacting on you as a group. So those things will make a big difference if you've experienced vicarious trauma previously. Okay, great. Thanks, Anne Law. Uh, now we ha do have another question uh, through here. Do organizations working with survivors of violence have policies, guidelines, and procedures to deal with vicarious trauma? It depends, again, it, uh, the, so some organizations have them, uh, some don't, um, and because the literature is so confusing about vicarious trauma, there's so many different names for it, different recommendations for it, that uh, what I find when I've done supervision with different organizations is that some of them are very evidence-based, up-to-date policy on, on 
on vicarious trauma, and some have policy uh, that's not so up to date. So what they have in place is probably not what I would consider best practice. So it really depends on the organization. But if they can, you know, I would encourage uh, organization to have a policy in place around those elements I presented earlier on to make sure they have um, processes in place to protect workers and prevent vicarious trauma. Okay, we've got another interesting question come through here. The question is, I'm worried that if I experience vicarious trauma, I won't be able to work in my chosen field anymore. Is there any information on how people recover after vicarious trauma and whether they go back to work? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. As I mentioned, um, while in some industries, particularly like I'm thinking about child protection, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, about 50% of workers will probably have some experience of vicarious traumatization. It doesn't mean that they will develop um, problems to an extent that it's impacting on their work or on their home life or their ability to function. So very often you have workers where they have, um, they find themselves preoccupied with the trauma, they find themselves having some intrusive thoughts about their client's trauma, they might feel slightly more disengaged from their work, uh, struggling to sh turn up to work, uh, anxious about particular clients, but it doesn't mean that they can't function. And they find that over, uh, particularly if they receive help and support uh, from their workplace, um, that after a few weeks or a couple of months that that eases off and they can re-engage with their work. So that's a common experience, even in environments where it's more likely to happen. Um, but for there's a small percentage of people that do experience uh, symptoms that are much more like what we would call burnout, where you feel really like your work is meaningless, you feel disengaged with your work, you feel hopeless, and where you find that the, the, the kind of industry you're in no longer holds meaning for you. Again, people with the right counseling can re-engage with that industry. So having a counseling that has gives you practical strategies to deal with those feelings and the impact of vicarious trauma can help you get back to work, so it, it, but it, you do need to go to counselling then. Okay, and our next question is, some research that I have read spoke a great deal about communalisation as a, a means of protecting against vicarious trauma. Do you believe joining with others in action and voice, such as uh, Reclaim the Night, is important? Yes, uh, that's a sh so the, one of the risk factors, as I mentioned, is um, not having enough meaning, feeling like you're not helping on having enough impact in your work. So depending on who you are, for some some people having an advocacy role and, and doing things like uh, joining something like Reclaim the Night can give a sense of meaning uh, that helps protect you from the impact of the work. Having said that, what I would be very mindful of as a worker is that, again, that you balance that with finding meaning outside of that work as well. So uh, you find that resilient people uh, often are driven and have a meaning that they want to make a difference uh, and that their life has a lot of meaning, but they also have meaning in experiences that are different, that are about uh, being content, finding pleasure, finding connections with their family, with their friends, so other kind of meaning. So that if you do engage in those kinds of um, uh, um, uh, actions that provide meaning for you, they balance with a more personal kind of meaning as well. Very long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks, Anne Law. Now, we probably do just have time for one last question. Um, so the question is, do you have any techniques social workers can follow to prevent themselves from vicarious trauma? Yes. Well, for social workers, I think what's really important is one, to have training in trauma-informed care because as a social worker uh, in most industries, you will encounter trauma. And if you don't have the, and, and it's so important as a social worker to feel like you're effective and you're helping your client. And if you do find that you can engage with trauma and work effectively with it, uh, even if you, it's not the main part of your work, uh, but you have ways to uh, to manage your client's feelings very, in very simple ways. You have ways of helping them engage even in further therapy and managing their trauma. That will really have a 
big impact on your um, uh, in protecting you from uh, working with people that have experienced trauma. Uh, so that's probably one of the most critical factors. So I, I would make sure I'm trained in trauma-informed care. And then the other thing is making sure that there is a good uh, individual and peer uh, supervision process that allows you time to reflect on your work and the impact of the work the work has on you. So really, reflecting supervision is incredibly important. That's great. Thanks, Santa Law. Um, now we are just about out of time, so thank you so much for answering all of those questions, and thank you to everybody who has attended today's webinar. Please do stay logged in to take our short online survey, and at the end of the survey, you'll be provided with a link to our discussion forum where you can ask Anne Law any further questions or any uh, of the questions we may not have had time for during the presentation. On behalf of the entire 1800 Respect team, thank you for attending this webinar, and we hope that you found it very valuable. Please stay online now to take our quick survey and join the online discussion. Thank you.